everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to flow through change, then do we have the tapping solution to create lasting change show for you. Today, I'll be talking with Jessica Ortner, the New York Times bestselling author of The Tapping Solution for Weight Loss and Body Confidence, co-producer of The Tapping Solution documentary, and the author of a beautiful new book, The Tapping Solution to Create Lasting Change. And that's just what I want to talk with her about today, about how to get unstuck and find your flow. That, plus we'll talk about patched couches and psychologists, Louise Hay and interviews, Jim Carrey and the Golden Globes, two or three that is, Lucas in California, what on earth is future tripping, George Costanza and the Yankees, <laughs> wedding invitations and the suck, and what in the world Longham channels have to do with anything. So welcome to the show, Jessica. Are you ready to shine? I am ready to shine. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, and a mighty woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> so before we dive right into things, wow, where do we go with this? I want to go right to tapping in pregnancy, but before we do that, let's talk about your weight challenges growing up and how you turn things around. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, a lot of those challenges with my weight and my body confidence also inspired this book. So it's a perfect segue. Um, since I was 14, maybe 15 years old, that's when I started my first diet. Yeah. And I would run this pattern where I would panic about my weight. I never felt like I was thin enough. And I made all of these rules saying, well, I can't date until I lose weight. I can't feel confident until I lose weight. I can't speak up until I lose weight. And so my whole life starting at 15 really revolved around weight loss and it became this obsession. And I would run this pattern where I would start a diet and we've all been there. And maybe for the listeners, it's not weight, it's struggling with finances or a relationship, but we all have something where we're like, I just want to change this one thing. If I can change this one thing, my life will be better. And then what do we do? We panic. And we think that we can stress our way to a solution. And so I would just jump into the next fad diet that came my way. And I would be very self-critical. And I felt like it made me a grounded, self-aware person. I thought I could kind of hate myself happy. I could push myself to make a change. And I was scared of being more supportive of myself because I thought I needed that voice to push me forward. And the tricky thing about that pressure that we feel to change is that for a very short time, it works. You start any diet and after five days, you might drop half a pound or a pound, whatever diet you do. But the problem is because it's fueled by so much pressure and so much anxiety, it doesn't last long we get to the point where we sabotage ourselves because we're simply exhausted from the pushing. And then we self-sabotage ourselves and we go right back to where we started. And then we run the circle again of saying, okay, this time it's it. This time I'm ready. This time I'm really going to lose weight. And we jump on another diet. So I was running this pattern over and over again. And as Einstein famously said, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And I realized something had to change because I'd been doing this for over a decade. And at the time I was learning, I was really getting into the stress relief technique called tapping. Yeah. And I decided to take a step back and to begin to look at not just the actions, not just my weight, but my relationship with myself and my relationship with food mm -hmm. and look at how stress and this panic I felt around not being good enough was dictating my habits and why it was making it so difficult for me to change. And when I started to use tapping and the stress relief technique to begin to create changes in my life, everything began to flow. Because Michael, as you know, when we are feeling good, we're resourceful, we're creative, we're innovative, we're in control. Mm -hmm. But the moment we're overwhelmed with stress, we feel hijacked by so many emotions. So by looking at my emotions and using this technique that uses the mind and body, I felt like I had control again. And that's what really started me on this journey and made me realize 
this, this really works and we need to talk about this. We need to have a new conversation around change. I, I love it. And we're going to dive into change more than, more than weight loss or body image today, but it's fascinating to me. I geek out on this stuff and was a professional athlete for many years. The minute that your nervous system is up, no matter what diet you're going into, your body's response is must hoard, must hold yeah. on to weight. An emergency is coming, must flood my system with sugar. Let's create an insulin challenge here. And so no matter what you do, if you don't get the nervous system under control, and I can hear our audience members already getting their nervous system up about having their nervous system up. Don't worry, we'll <laughs> talk about that. But if you don't get that under control, then anything you do to lose weight, the body is trying to protect itself and holding on. Yes, exactly. So let's, let's skip all of the other precursors. Take us to tapping 101. And I feel like we should take a deep breath here. <sighs> My pleasure. So um, for those who are new to tapping, I'm thrilled that you're hearing this for the first time. I think that we get introduced to things for a reason. And if you are a tapping veteran, it's always good to go over the basics. So tapping is a stress relief technique where you use your fingers to stimulate different acupressure points on your face and body. Mm -hmm. A lot of these points we already intuitively use when we're stressed. So have you ever noticed someone, you know, at their desk and kind of going like this. Now, if you're, if you're listening and not watching me, I'm using my fingers and kind of grabbing the bridge of my nose, yep. or you put your hand on your chest. So these are points that we intuitively know help us relax. What we're doing with tapping is we're consciously bringing up what is creating the anxiety in our body as we stimulate these points. Because when we are feeling anxious, it's not an experience we just have in our mind. We've all been in a situation where we feel totally nervous, incredibly anxious, and we just try to say something positive. And it just doesn't land because we have that feeling in the pit of our stomach or that tension in our chest. Emotions have a, a real impact on the physical body. So what you're doing with tapping is you're actually consciously allowing yourself to focus on what it is that's causing that physical reaction. And as you focus on that tension, you stimulate these points through tapping on these acupressure points. And it sends a calming signal to the brain, letting your brain know it's safe to relax. Because when we are feeling anxious about a phone call, yep. our body reacts the same way. And I know your listeners know this. Our, our body reacts the same way as our ancestors' bot, body did when it was a life-threatening experience. We have an overproduction of cortisol. We have adrenaline. We have all of this anxiety, but we are actually physically safe, but our body acts like it's not. It goes into that fight-or-flight response. So by focusing on what it is that's triggering the physical response while tapping, you calm the nervous system. You relax your body. Now you're in control. Now you can think positively. Now you can use all the things you know. A lot of people say to me, Michael, I know so much, but I get frustrated because I'm not doing what I know. And I have been in this position as well, right? You know all these things, but the moment you panic, it's like you forget it all. And it happens to all of us. It's our natural human reaction. And so the moment we can realize it's not just you, this is how we react. You can focus not on figuring it out, but just calming the nervous system, calming your body, knowing that once you feel calm, before you fix the problem, before you have the answers, then you are resourceful and you can use everything that you know. So I want to go into, thank you for sharing. I want to go into tapping 101. Before we do that, we don't need a giant overview today, but what's the okay. science showing with tapping? So... It's really interesting because we're finally beginning to get research on what is happening to the brain yep. when you use acupressure points. Um, and what we're seeing is Harvard actually did a research study with needles, with acupressure needles. So it's a little bit different, but it's mm -hmm. stimulating the same acupressure points and showing that the amygdala, that part of the brain that's the danger, where the danger signal comes from, begins to relax. There's not as much activity when you stimulate these points. There's also been great research around cortisol level levels. Cortisol is the stress hormone. So, uh, you know, we all need cortisol. It's healthy. 
But when we have an overproduction of cortisol, when we're very stressed, that's when it creates havoc on the body. And Dr. Dawson Church has done an incredible study to show the way that cortisol drops after doing some tapping. So it's really exciting. And really in the last maybe three to five years, there's been a lot more uh, studies around what happens when you stimulate acupressure points. Beautiful. So from there, can you take us through... Uh, the basics of how tapping works, and then and then maybe we can dive into tapping on. I I I really want to understand this technique of tapping and meditation, for instance, to remove anxiety. Yes. Okay. So the very first thing that you need to do with tapping is get clear on what's bothering you. So sometimes we have a lot of changes we want to make in our lives, and we feel overwhelmed. And someone says, "I don't know where to start." Yeah. Start with what is creating the most anxiety. What's the thought? right now that's making you the most anxious. When you get clear on that thought, you start with the setup statement. Now the setup statement is when you tap on the side of the hand Mm -hmm. and you say it three times and it goes something like this. Even though I'm anxious about this meeting, that's the example I'll choose. Even though I feel anxious about this meeting, I accept myself and how I feel. Or you can simply say, if you're working with someone else who feels uncomfortable with saying, I accept myself and how I feel, you can simply say, I'm okay. The reason we start there is because it helps neutralize judgment we have around the problem and have an honest conversation with ourselves. When we stop trying to fight the fact that we feel a certain way and we accept it, now that's when the honesty and the resistance goes away. Once you do that three times while tapping on the side of the hand, you begin to stimulate stimulate the rest of the points. Uh, Do you want me to go through the nine points? Let's do that, please. Let's do it. So we have the the karate chop point, and it doesn't matter what side of the hand you tap on. The eyebrow point, and it's right where the hairs of your eyebrows begin. And then if you follow your eyebrow, you follow the bone, you'll find yourself on the side of the eye, and you're going to go right on that bone. Then follow the bone again until you're underneath the eye. Perfect. Underneath the nose. Then we have underneath the mouth, which is really right underneath the mouth. Some people call it the chin point. Yeah. Then the collarbone point. Now, if you feel the U-shaped bone and you go down an inch and over an inch on either side, you're going to hit it. Sometimes I just like to use my whole hand and tap on my chest to stimulate the point. Thymus. The next, exactly. The next one is um, underneath the arm, and it's a hand width from your armpit. Mm -hmm. And for women, it tends to be where your bra strap lies. And then the last point is on the top of the head. So, you know, we have this. So those are the nine points. What's great is once you memorize those nine points, you can use it for anything. And even if you don't know what to say for the setup statement or something happens in the moment, like say you get rear-ended and in that moment, you're stressed. You don't have to think or say anything. You can simply start by stimulating the points to help calm your body. But when we do a tapping meditation or the whole process, there, it, there's more of a technique involved. But my point is the power is in the acupressure points. So learn these points and use them. Beautiful. So from there, um, I know we've had Nick on and we've had Dawson Church on on the basics of repeating a statement over through the whole cycle. But maybe you can share with us what is a tapping meditation and we can use that to remove some anxiety here for people. Yeah, absolutely. So the reason I call it a tapping meditation is because these are experiences that are designed for anyone who can listen to them and begin to feel more calm. The thing about having a tapping experience or working with a practitioner is that it's really helpful to be as specific as possible, right? But with a tapping meditation, you can be a little bit more general. So it's a little bit different. Um, but you can still have a calming effect. And one of the things that, that um, I've been creating lately, we're working on an app right now with tapping meditations cool. and giving people a, a round where they just allow whatever they feel to come up. Tapping and meditating go so well together because oftentimes we sit down, we want to zen out, we want to clear our mind, but there's that one thing in the back of our mind that just is grabbing our attention. And by honoring it and doing the tapping, we calm the nervous system, and then we can really go into the positive. 
if when you begin to clear that when you can begin to say something negative to yourself, but it doesn't have a physical reaction anymore. Mm-hmm. When you feel calm, if you say I'm not good enough and you feel anxious, that has power. If you say I'm not good enough and you just feel totally relaxed, you're like, eh, is that, I don't really think that's true. Yeah. I don't have to believe every thought that comes into my mind, especially when we feel calm. Then we have the power to say things that are more positive and it has room to land. Beautiful. So then let's, let's, well, first off, how did you come up with the idea? So tapping meditation, if I'm understanding it right, is you kind of, it almost has like a double cycle to it. And on one cycle, you're addressing the problem that's coming up and you're helping people feel more comfortable with the problem. It's also like, almost like a two column sheet. And then we are replacing it with something else, with more of a, so we're, we're in a sense, removing or I call it shorting out something in the nervous system on the negative, making space, and then allowing the positive, the affirmative to come in. Exactly. So can you go through something with us on that? Or or should we do that when we come to a particular, well, we can do it for the next one. And it's where we're going to start helping us get unstuck. Because that's like yeah. the biggest, we've got so many self-help junkies, myself included, listening to the show. We get all this information and then we can't figure out how to step forward with it. Yes. So I think a great place to always start when you want to make a change is to address the initial anxiety that we feel. And something that's important to know about change, about getting unstuck, is that sometimes Although we might not consciously know it in the moment, staying stuck feels safer Mm -hmm. than making a change. And that's because even if we want to make a change that we know is empowering, that we know we're excited about, our subconscious mind, its primary goal is to keep us safe. And safety and certainty are almost one in the same. Our brain loves certainty because even if we're miserable, we know the misery. It feels it feels comfortable. We know we're not going to die. Mm-hmm. We know we've done this before. And so our mind says, well, this feels better. And then if we say to ourselves, well, I want to get unstuck and I want to start speaking more. I want to start going on stage. Well, there can be a part of us that doesn't feel like it's safe to be seen. And so staying stuck really helps us. It serves us. Um, This is a quote from a great tapping practitioner, Brad Yates, which really touched me was self or self sabotage is simply misguided self love. love That that. if you're holding yourself back at some level, your mind and body doesn't think it's safe to take a step forward. So your job isn't to find the perfect diet or the perfect financial strategy. Your job isn't to criticize yourself or push yourself to take action. Your job is to let your mind and body know that it's safe. It's safe to try. It's safe to make a mistake. It's safe to learn because when we can feel safe moving forward, Mm -hmm. then we get unstuck and we move forward with more flow and with more ease. The very first place that we want to start is to deal with any anxiety we might have in the moment around change. And and if you'd like, we can jump into some tapping and just do a, a really simple experience. So listening, take a nice deep breath in. And And, and if you're driving down the road, save this for later. Save this for later. Save this for later. Um, And I'd like you to notice where you're holding anxiety or tension in your body. Notice if it's your stomach or your chest, your jaw. Notice that tension. Notice that anxiety. And on a scale from zero to 10, how strong does that feel? 10 being incredibly intense, zero feeling calm. From zero to 10, give that a number. Okay, perfect. Now we're going to start tapping. And if you're um, tapping, watching the video, you can follow along with me. If you're listening, I'm going to say the point as we go through. Okay, so we're going to start on the karate chop point. We're going to stay here for what's called three rounds. And just simply repeat after me. Even though I have this anxiety in my body, And Michael, why don't you go ahead and repeat after me as well? And for those who are listening, you can repeat out loud or in your own mind. Even though I have this anxiety in my body. I accept myself. I accept myself. And I give my body permission to relax. And I give my body permission to relax.
And I feel this anxiety in my body. And I feel this anxiety in my body. I accept myself and how I feel. I accept myself and how I feel. Even though I have this anxiety in my body. Even though I have this anxiety in my body. I honor everything I've been through. I honor everything I've been through. And I give my body permission to relax. And I give my body permission to relax. Great. Now we're going to start tapping on the eyebrow point. And this is when we're going to give a voice to that anxiety. So on the eyebrow point, simply repeat after me, this anxiety in my body. This anxiety in my body. Side of the eye. I have a lot going on in my life. I have a lot going on in my life. Under the eye. And I'm holding this tension in my body. And I'm holding this tension in my body. Under the nose. All of this stress. All of this stress. Chin or under the mouth. It's safe to acknowledge it. It's safe to acknowledge it. Collarbone. All the stress and tension. All the stress and tension. Under the arm and the way I'm holding it in my body. And the way I'm holding it in my body. Top of the head. All of this stress and tension. All of this stress and tension. Now tap on the eyebrow point and simply think about what is causing you the most anxiety in your life right now. So you don't have to repeat after me or say anything, but as you continue to tap on the eyebrow point, just let whatever you feel come up. And we're going to move to the side of the eye. And as you continue to tap there, notice what it feels like to allow your body to relax as you think about what's been creating the most stress in your life. Moving to under the eye. Imagine yourself telling a friend about what's going on in your life. When someone asks you, why are you feeling anxious? Why are you feeling stressed? What do you respond with? Tapping under the nose. Continue to notice what comes up and how you feel as you relax your body. Under the mouth. Continue to think about what's creating the most stress. And notice how you can still think about it, but feel more relaxed in your body. Tapping on the collarbone point, letting any remaining thoughts come up about this particular anxiety. And now tapping underneath the arm, I'd like you to repeat after me. Even though there's a lot going on. Even though there's a lot going on. Top of the head, I give my body permission to relax. I give my body permission to relax. Eyebrow, because right now and right here. Because right now and right here. Side of the eye, I'm okay. I'm okay. Under the eye, I don't need all the answers right now. I don't need all the answers right now. Under the nose, in order to feel calm in my body. In order to feel, feel calm in my body. Chin, it's safe to relax. It's safe to relax. Collarbone, even before anything changes. Even before anything changes. Under the arm, feeling relaxed and centered in my body. I'm feeling relaxed and centered in my body. Top of the head, even before anything changes. Even before anything changes. Because I know I am safe. Because I know I am safe. Okay, take a nice deep breath in. And exhale. 
And now I'd like you to check in again with your body and notice where you were feeling that tension in your body before. Notice that exact spot. And now ask yourself if it has shifted. Maybe it went from an eight to a six or all the way down to a two. Notice what number you give it now. And really take in that with just a few minutes of tapping, you can move that anxiety. You can begin to feel more in control even before anything changes. So I went to my biggest stress or concern, which was, I, I muscle tested on it. It was a five right now during the interview. And it's down to a zero. Really? And I'm That's jello. A... <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'd love to um, really quickly break down what we just did Please so people do. can do this on their own. Um, and I want to mention one th something else, so actually, before I do that. Sometimes when we are feeling anxious, we're not actually clear around why we're anxious. We're just running around, you know, in our daily lives, feeling this anxiety. And then when we begin to get still and get clear on what's bothering us, sometimes that anxiety can actually go higher. You can start at a five. And then when you start tapping and you really focus on it, it can intensify. But what that means is that you finally are targeting what's really there, that that first measurement was you being dissociated. But if you're able to, if you do feel any type of increase, it just means that you're finally pinpointing what it is that's been running things behind the scenes and you can continue tapping. And the best way to tap by yourself is to pretend that you're talking to your closest friends yeah. and you're just telling them what's going on. It's not about pretty language. It's not about a specific strategy. It's about having an honest conversation with the experience that you're having. And I know a lot of people who love the law of attraction get resistant because they're like, why aren't I affirming yeah. this? I don't want to affirm this. You're not affirming it because what's happening is these thoughts are there running you behind the scenes. If they, if you weren't anxious, then it wouldn't be true. But because you have this anxiety, these thoughts are, could have this control. And by giving them a voice, you, they no longer have control over you because you give them a voice as you relax your body and now you're in control to say, is this really true? Is this really what I want? And so it's always good to be specific. Pretend you're talking to a friend. Start with where you are. When the intensity goes lower than a three, mm -hmm. then you can begin to bring in these positive affirmations. And some of the easiest ones is simply saying right now and right here, I'm okay. Because when we're feeling anxiety, we are not right here. We are in the past or we're in the future. And letting ourselves know that we are safe and letting our body know that we're safe in the moment mm -hmm. gives us the power of the present moment where we can make better decisions. Is this something you would have people get up in the morning, do a little meditation, look for their MPI, their most pressing issue, and just start going for it? Yes, exactly. And you know, there some for some people it works to have a very that have a structure. You know, they wake up, they have a time when they tap. But what I like about the thing I like about tapping is that if you're at work and your coworker is driving you nuts and you know that you are about to say something that you regret, mm -hmm. you can go to the bathroom stall and just in a few minutes begin to start tapping on how you're feeling without saying anything, just saying or just thinking I accept how I feel, even though she's driving me crazy. And tapping on the rest of the points while you are focusing on how you're feeling. So it, it's definitely great in a structure. But what I love about it is you can do what I refer to as SOS tapping, that emergency five minute tapping before you, you know, say something that you're going to regret. <laughs> Tap before the phone call, before the text, oh, and yes. certainly before the email. <laughs> Please. I've learned that the hard way. <laughs> so let's go from there. Let's talk about critical voices, something you were addressing beforehand, and this desire to bully ourselves into success. Yeah. I mean, I mentioned it before. The really tricky thing about the critical voice is it works for a very short time. You know, if we are really mean to ourselves, maybe we do start the diet for two days or we get on that financial plan or we decide to do something different. But it never lasts. We always will end up sabotaging ourselves. And one of the things I write in the book that 
I mean, if someone can remember just this quote from this interview, I will be so happy. And that is, if it's not pleasurable, it's not sustainable. So yes, making a change can feel a little unnerving and that's natural. But if we can't focus on finding the pleasure Mm -hmm. around starting a new habit, it's not sustainable. And I did begin, the first time I really noticed this was when I began to look at my challenge with weight in a whole new way, I began to interview and ask people who were consistent with exercising how they did it. And not a single, Michael, not one single person told me they work out because they hate their body. And that was the sole reason I was going to the gym was because I wanted to change. They all talked about this pleasure, this loving it, the endorphins. So we have to find a way to make things pleasurable and that critical voice makes it impossible to do so. So I I've, uh, used to be a professional athlete, was a cyclist, was a speed skater, got back into it after 15 years off this summer for, I don't even know why. It's like a calling. I, I really, yeah. I'm dumbfounded. Each time I'm out there, I'm going, what, what am I doing? So yesterday had a road race. My last road race a couple weeks ago didn't go so well. I wasn't able to stay in my heart-centered space. I was thinking about sustainability. I had done tapping beforehand over the last few weeks, going hunting for things. And my whole job yesterday was to stay in my heart space. And so as I'm going along, thank you for my staying in my heart space. Thank you for my staying in my heart space. I finished well, better than I'd done. I keep improving little by little. But that thing that you just said about pleasure and sustainability, I finished after an hour and 20 of what wasn't a race to me, but what was a meditation of staying in my heart space on fire. And when you find that thing that makes you on fire, you will, you become addicted to it. It is. And what's what I, another point that I talk about later in the book, but I think it fits in with what we're talking about is that when you begin to find more pleasure in what you're doing, the outcome isn't so important. So yes, you want to improve your time and it's nice to kind of have that goal and that achievement, but it doesn't become the be all end all. And the reason that's so essential is that everyone starts as a beginner. So Mm -hmm. when we're going through a change, you'll always start as a beginner and beginners don't finish first. You know, beginners, you have to start somewhere, but if you always, you don't give yourself any space to make mistakes Mm -hmm. or to learn, then you're always going to feel stuck. And the challenge with the critical voice is that the critical voice does not let you make a mistake. Um, the critical, because the critical voice kind of swoops in and says, you shouldn't have done that. It's embarrassing. What are you thinking? But if we're not able to make mistakes and experiment with our lives, then we're not actually going to get anywhere. And I think this idea of failure is so silly. You didn't fail. You had expectations that weren't met. You made these expectations. You didn't meet them. But it's like when a scientist does a research study, they don't fail when they don't prove their hypothesis. They actually have that data to know that their hypothesis was wrong, which means now they're so much further ahead to figure out the problem that they're trying to solve. So we actually need, when we're trying to make a change, we really need those experiences when we try something and it doesn't go as planned. And when we can enjoy the part of trying, that end result doesn't mean so much that we can keep going with more ease until we finally get to the place that we want to be. I think that's brilliant. And I love I love the line, though it could be a limiting belief, but I love it. Beginners don't finish first because we have all of these beliefs. Maybe you can share another one with us. Common limiting beliefs. And I, I love what you said. Ari, do you remember Ariana Huffington's quote that you put in the yes. book? I, I don't want to put you on the spot. No, no. She said, um, I interviewed her on my podcast and she said to me that her mother used to tell her that failure is not the opposite of success. It's part of success. And that really stuck to me that this failure, this idea of things not going as planned is actually essential to your own success. Can you tell us, there's, there's a term I believe you came up with, I love it, future tripping. Yes. So I don't know if I came, it's like somewhere in the internet. I don't know where I heard it, but I don't know if I came up with it, but um, I'm guilty of it. And future tripping is when we think so much about the future that we feel so much anxiety that we can't take any action. So one of the biggest beliefs that people have that keep them stuck 
is this idea that I need all the answers before I start. Yeah. And so what happens is you're listening to all the podcasts, you're reading all the books, you're doing all the research, but you're never taking a step forward because you feel like you need to map out start to finish. And what happens is it's absolutely a hundred percent impossible to succeed with that strategy. Maybe you'll call that a limiting belief, but from my experience, I've never seen a single person from, you know, Steve Jobs to Oprah Winfrey say from the very start that they were able to map out their success. What happens is you have the courage to take those first few steps. From taking those first few steps, you have a new vantage point. And so now your strategy might drastically shift from what you thought you were going to do a month ago because you have new information um, from that new vantage point. But what keeps us stuck is this fear of this idea that I need to know everything. And I think it was, um, it's such a great example. And I'm, I'm completely stealing it from my brother, Nick, who's also an author. But he was talking with someone who wanted to record a CD. And she was like, well, I don't know how to distribute CDs. And he's like, well, have you recorded the CD? And she's like, no. And he's like, start with recording the CD. Like that's your first step. And then from there you figure out the rest, but we stop ourselves from doing so much because we don't have every step figured out. There's, there's another term you, t you, you mention in here, and I, I love that example from Nick as well. There's another term that you mention here, which is we don't do the work. I'll put that in quotes. We don't do the work of the inner journey until we have all the answers. And one of those answers, we say, when I get that answer, then I'll dive in the life purpose trap. Oh, oh I, every time someone says, how do I find my life purpose, my heart breaks. I do not like that word, life purpose, because... It puts so much pressure on us as human beings that we need to find one specific thing. Mm -hmm. Your life purpose is whatever you're excited about today. And it can evolve from when you're 20 to when you're 60. It's going to change. But when we think we have to have this one specific life purpose, it's like we miss out on all the amazing things in life yeah. waiting for this one calling. And Michael, I'm sure there are people who can say, I have a life purpose and I've known it since I was 10 years old, but we're not all in that category. And I think feeling like we have to have that can be incredibly limiting and a big waste of time because we, we lose ourselves with the anxiety around the life purpose that we miss all the great opportunities that we have in front of us. Thank you. So I've, I've got to swing us around here for a minute. Jessica and I are in baby planning mode. We have a lot of listeners in baby planning mode or pregnant at this time. What can you tell us about baby planning and tapping or pregnancy and tapping? Well, first of all, since, since for those who are watching in the video, I'm going to give you, look how big my belly is. <laughs> so I'm, um, I'm eight months pregnant. And this is my first baby. So the last thing I want to be is one of those experts that is pregnant and just becomes a baby expert because I am figuring this out and I want to be very honest and upfront yep. um, that this is my first time. And so I'm learning from so many people, but I do, I do see how the lessons I've learned with tapping are really supporting me now because this is such a big change. And the challenge with big changes is that we can't control everything. So I can plan to have the best labor and to strategize and do everything I can to support myself, but I can't actually control what kind of labor I have. I can't control what kind of baby I have. I can't, there's so many things that are out of our control. And when those experiences happen and we feel out of control, our default tends to be anxiety, right? And we go to worry and anxiety. And so by understanding that, I've been able to catch myself the moment I feel that way and remind myself the very best thing I can do for me and my baby is to relieve stress and to trust and to know that whether things go the way I planned or whether they don't, I'm going to be okay. And for me, you know, that type of work with tapping of knowing that like I am resilient, that no matter what happens, I'm going to be okay has been a huge stress reliever. And I've and the last thing I want to mention is I've been creating these tapping meditations for this. App. I keep mentioning this app because I'm in the midst of creating it. It doesn't so come cool. out till probably late October, but we have a pregnancy section. And one of the tapping meditations that's my favorite mm -hmm. is stress about the stress. And I'm saying this specifically to your audience because <laughs> your audience like me 
we're readers, we're podcast listeners, we're very aware of the of the challenges stress creates on our body. We know it's not good for the baby, but at the same time, this idea that we're not allowed to have a single ounce of stress and if we are feeling stress then we're failing creates more pressure and more stress. And so what I've really began to wrap my mind around is well the moments I feel stress and then I decide to do something about it, I'm teaching my baby resiliency. I'm teaching my baby how to go from stress to peace because that's what I'm doing. But if I have a moment of stress and all I do is obsess about how bad that is for my baby, I'm just building upon that stress. And um, to me, that's been a really important concept to understand. Well, it sounds like that goes all the way back to your early days with body image, acceptance, allowance, and not in judgment. Yes. And you know what? Like These things are great things to talk about but they're often hard to feel if we don't have a tool. And so this is why I love tapping because yes, I practice this, but pregnancy is new to me and there's hormones and there's different experiences. So I've really depended on using a technique to bring me back to balance. How often, you you talk about in the beginning of your book, after you first became a New York Times bestseller of tripping and falling, so to speak, about forgetting tapping for a little bit and, and spiraling. Yeah. How much are you doing it now? What's, what's like a regular practice for you? Well, now being pregnant, I'm using it almost every day. But um, because I'm in book launch mode, one of the things I've started to do is to find the pockets of time. Mm-hmm. So instead of having the structure, it might just be at 10 o'clock when I have 30 minutes between um, meetings and I'll just simply tap for 10 minutes. And that really helps me a lot. Um, one of the things you're right, I I did start off the book with this. When we're feeling stressed, we forget to do what we know. And so one of the very best things to do is first to have a little self-compassion. If we, if you didn't meditate, if you didn't tap, the moment you can feel a little self-compassion knowing that you didn't do those things because you were scared. And when we're scared, we revert to our younger selves. And in, in that moment, I talk about in the book, I was speaking to Cheryl Richardson, an incredible author, and I was telling her how embarrassed I was that I wasn't tapping, that I had this book and I wasn't doing what I know. And she said, Jessica, when we're scared because something's new and we're overwhelmed, we're, you're not your adult Jessica self who's the tapping expert. You're little, this little girl who's scared. And this little girl, above anything else, needs your own love and support. And the moment she said that, and I could release judgment about doing things perfectly, I could do things well enough. And it made a big difference. Uh, <laughs> I remember when I first learned tapping years ago, and, and I was finding it such a powerful tool. I still do, I even more so. Um, and it's, it's part of my daily practice. I remember that if I was having a rough time, things aren't going well, things blew up, whatever, my emotions are high, my wife, Jessica, would say, Michael, why don't you tap? And my little inner child would say, no, anything but that. What happens when the little child kicks in? And then, you know, a few minutes or half an hour or an hour later, pouty Michael would finally go, she's right, you know, and go through all the points. How do we get ourselves past that when that kicks up inside us and says, I don't want to tap right now? Um, uh, One of the best things to do, the reason that when someone says, why don't you tap on that? like. Listen, if my if I'm upset and my family member says, how about you tap on that? I want to punch them too. Like, <laughs> I don't, and I'm a tapping expert. But the reason is when someone says tap on it, what we tend to hear is get over it mm-hmm. or like meditate on it or, you know, fix it. Like just do this thing. And obviously that's not your wife's intentions and that's mm-hmm. not other people's intentions, but it's how we tend to interpret it, right? Like th- when she says tap on it, doesn't a part of you go, no, like let me just oh, feel. Yeah. I I actually just want to be upset right now. And the big part about tapping is accepting how you feel. So I think it's important that if you're in a moment and you're saying, I don't want to tap right now, acknowledge the fact that you're choosing to be upset, that this is an emotion that you want to express, that it's actually okay. You want to feel upset. It's like the moment we just say, even in our mind, even though I'm upset, I accept the fact that I'm upset and I want to be upset. It's like the moment we stop trying to fix it, we can feel calmer and then we can go into the more formal tapping on the side of the hand and saying, 
even though I'm angry, I accept how I feel. But sometimes just by saying to yourself, I just want to be angry right now and I just accept the fact this is how I want to feel, that type of consciousness Mm -hmm. around how we feel creates a lot more ease to help us move forward. Awesome. And since you're talking about ease, you're talking about space, you're talking about room, what does it mean to make room for you? The idea that in the busyness of everything, we get to go to self-care and self-care is not selfish. It's perhaps the most important thing we do for ourselves. It is. For me, you know, the, the subtitle of the book is A Guide to Get Unstuck and Find Your Flow. And to me, I defined flow as a natural state of movement. Mm-hmm. And nature has flow. So right now we're recording in the summer. Um, and we flow into the season. So summer is going to flow into fall and the leaves are going to, the trees are going to let go of their leaves and things are going to die away. And it's part of the flow. It's part of this movement of letting things go that no longer serve us. We all need those moments, those falls in our lives, those autumn days where we allow ourselves to slow down. Because if we don't do that, we're not able to then have spring. Nothing blooms 100% of the time. So you shouldn't expect yourself to bloom 100% of the time. Going in and taking care of yourself is actually essential for those moments in your life when you are a bit more external and helping others and speaking up and pursuing a dream. But if you don't balance that out with the self-care, then you're going to get stuck because it feels too overwhelming to constantly try to be in bloom. Is overwhelm, and now that does get into clutter, in this case, clutter of the, of the mind, how can we use tapping to overcome overwhelm? Well, the wonderful thing about overwhelm and tapping is that when we feel overwhelmed, it's because it tends to be not just one thing, Mm -hmm. right? So we don't even know how we're feeling because we have our, you know, we're taking care of maybe our older parents and our kids want something. And now we have a work thing and there's all of these things at once coming at us. And the very best thing that we can do is begin to tap on just the anxiety, the exercise that we did together, Mm -hmm to tap on the anxiety, because when you can begin to calm down, you can begin to separate what's happening in your life and figure out, well, what really is here? What is creating the most stress in my life? Overwhelm is a state of confusion because we don't know where to focus on. I mean, we we don't know even what's causing our stress. So one of the best things to create that space is just to focus on the physical experience that overwhelm causes And then we can really begin to break it down and get more specific and tap on any thoughts or beliefs that come up. Beautiful. And going from overwhelm, another important one, and I like how you how you use this as a positive. What's our procrastination trying to tell us and how do we tap on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think procrastination is um, one of the most fascinating topics to me. And I think one of the best things to know is that you are not a procrastinator. You were not born and the nurse did not bring you to your mother and say, congratulations, you have a procrastinator. But we we take on that identity and we say, I am a procrastinator. No, procrastination is an action that we do. And we need to go deeper to see what's behind that action. So sometimes procrastination is your intuition telling you now is not the time. Right? So you can't decide. And maybe that just means that the two choices that you have in front of you, neither are right. And so being able to quiet your mind and to look at your procrastination, you can find out this is actually a positive thing because going forward doesn't feel right right now. The other thing is that procrastination is often a sign of fear. So we we touched upon it earlier um, with our time together that sometimes staying stuck feels safer than moving forward. And so when you begin to procrastinate, a great question to ask yourself is what's the downside of getting this done? Yeah. And In the beginning, we might go, no, no, I just want to get this done. Mm -hmm. But if we really slow down and calm our body and do some tapping and we say, what's the downside of getting this done? What's the downside of finishing the book? Well, if I finish the book, it can be critiqued. What's the downside of asking that girl out on a date? Well, if I finally get the courage, she could say no. And so we have these reasons that we procrastinate. So the tapping and our focus isn't on the, shouldn't be on the procrastination, should be on the fear behind the procrastination and knowing that no matter what outcome we get, because we, we have no crystal ball, we can't predict the future, yeah. but no matter what outcome we get, 
will be okay. Woohoo! <laughs> on, on that note, I, I can't resist. I want to I want to dive into what you said. Now is not the time, but before we do that, since we're 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 talking about the outcome being okay, celebrating one star reviews. Oh yes, <laughs> yes. So um, this is a a fun game that my brother and I started. And when our books came out, you know, you go on Amazon and people always write reviews. And the reality is the more reviews you get, the more likely you are to get a one-star review because there's no way that anyone has created anything that everybody likes. Like not everyone loves Monet or Mozart or, you know, Hanson, whatever it is. Like there's no type of creation that every single person on the world loves. And the reason that's important is we often stop ourselves from doing things because we're scared of them being critiqued. Yeah. But the challenge is, in order to avoid criticism, our only other option is to do nothing, is to play small and to hide. And that is a sacrifice that's not worth taking. Oh, and when we can begin to understand that a stranger on the internet criticizing us or someone not agreeing with our decision isn't life-threatening, we have the freedom to follow our own heart. And so with that, every time we got a one-star review on Amazon, the first one-star review, we'd be like, woohoo, someone doesn't like our book. Like, it means a lot of people are reading it, and someone took the time to say, this isn't for me. And so we began to do that with other authors, and every time they would get a one-star review, we'd say, woohoo, you got a one-star review. You're really touching a lot of people, because if you weren't touching a lot of people, you wouldn't have someone that didn't agree with you. And the moment you can be playful around that, you no longer have to fear it. That being said, for those who are listening, don't leave me a one-star <laughs> review. Yeah, I love the full stars. But for that, the times we get the one-star review, you realize like life goes on and it doesn't have any power over you. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go from there. Yes, everybody, go over to Amazon. First off, get the book. We'll give you the URLs in, the URLs in a minute. And if you feel like leaving a positive review, it is the greatest gift in the world that you can give Jessica. You said a minute ago, before we were doing that, we we're talking about procrastination. You said, now is not the time, that this is a concern that's going on with us. What happened when you were first supposed to interview Louise Hay? You've got a new dress. You're at the door. Yes. You know, while, so we're recording this on the anniversary of her passing. Mm -hmm. And I actually posted about this today and I've been thinking about it all day. Um, so I, um, Louise Hay agreed to allow me to interview her. And now Louise Hay, I have been obsessed with since I was maybe 14 years old. And I had told everybody about this interview. I would bought a new dress. I flew to um, San Diego and my brother was with me as well. Mm -hmm. And Nick at the time was coming out with the very first tapping solution book that was called the tapping solution. So Nick gets to her apartment a little bit before me because we're staying in different places. I show up, he opens the door and he looks at me and says, don't be mad, <laughs> which is like oh, no. terrified me. I was like, what, what happened? He's like, don't be mad. And I was like, okay. He's like, Louise wants, wants me to interview her. And I was like, okay. And he's like, I tried to convince her. I really want you to do it, but she really wants me to do it. Now, Louise's thought process was Nick is coming out with a new book mm -hmm. and I want to put him out there. And it was such a kind thing for her to do for my brother. And it was absolutely the right move, but it was such, it, it stung, you know, it felt like a punch in the gut. Like I had told everybody I felt embarrassed. And so, um, I wanted to cry, but instead I just channeled that energy and I started to put the lights together. So there I am like running back and forth, getting the lighting, making sure everything is right. And I'm trying to like hide my distress. And I hear Louise um, say my name, say Jessica. And she just looks at me and smiles and says, trust life. That's all she says. And Michael, there, like the way that she said it, it was like all of the frantic energy I felt, all of the disappointment I felt just calmed. And I just kept repeating to myself, trust life. And that moment was so powerful for me because it wasn't the outcome I wanted, but so many amazing things came from that experience. And one of the things I wrote about today, which th this, these experiences happened after I wrote the book, but I suffered from two miscarriages before this pregnancy. 
And because I had that experience of Louis saying, trust life, it made everything bearable and better because it's, it's easy to trust life when everything is going your way. But the magic of trusting life is when things aren't going your way, when you're dealing with heartbreak or tragedy, and there's a part of you that refuses to not believe that somehow good will come. When we can hold on to that belief, even when we have no evidence to support it, it's like life opens up and it's magic. And it helps us get through those difficult times. And eventually we look back and we can begin to connect those dots Mm -hmm. of those tragedies and realize that they made us better people, they made us more compassionate, and they led to really amazing things. And so this, I ended the book with talking about this concept of trusting life, because when we trust life, we can really have the resiliency to get through anything. Would you say that's the biggest gift that she gave you? 100% biggest gift that she gave me, yes. Woohoo! Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else, since it is her anniversary today, and we'll be airing this in just a few days, any other important nuggets that she gave you? Yes. um, The very first time that I spoke um, on Hay House, on a Hay House stage, I was absolutely terrified. And there was a lot of new authors, so all of us were very nervous. And it was the night before our big talk. And it was, they did like a cocktail hour. And Louise grabbed the microphone and she said that she was going to give us advice about speaking in public. So all of us like leaned forward, you know, it was like silent. Everybody could not wait to hear her advice for Mm -hmm. speaking in public. And she said to us, the moment you get off the stage, all I want you to do is say, I did a great job. And next time I'll be even better. And that was it. That's what she gave us. And she gave us the freedom to just allow ourselves to, to praise the courage to speak to let ourselves feel like, you know, no matter how it went, that like, I did a good job and next time I'll do better. And I just thought it was so sweet because I also thought she was going to give us some strategy or some something about speaking. And all she simply said was just stay positive. When you get off that stage, tell yourself, I did a good job. Woohoo! Yeah, woohoo! You know we get to wrap things up quickly here, but this has been this has been brilliant and phenomenal. First off, where can people go to find your beautiful book and to find out more? Thank you. So the book is sold wherever books are sold, mm-hmm. but you can also go on Amazon and feel free to leave a review, like we mentioned. Um, and if you go to the tappingsolution.com forward slash change, I have some great bonuses for when you order the book. Um, And our main website is thetappingsolution.com. We have some free tapping meditations there for you to enjoy. And um, I love connecting to people on Instagram, especially, and on Facebook. So it's just on Instagram, it's at Jessica Ortner. And you can look me up on Facebook as well. I'd love to stay connected and to hear about um, everyone's experience with the tapping that we did together today and the book. Awesome. So if you didn't catch the tappingsolution.com forward slash change, come on over to inspirenationshow.com. We'll get you over to the tappingsolution.com forward slash change. On that note, podcasts. Yes. Thank you so much for reminding me. So I have a podcast called Adventures in Happiness, Mm -hmm. um, and it's all about this crazy life and all its complexities and how we can find happiness with everything that's going on in this world. So you can just go over to iTunes and look up Adventures in Happiness or my name and subscribe. Excellent. And since you're saying talking about crazy life and complexities, and we were talking about trusting life, what can you tell us about your gut in California? Because that pertains to eight months pregnant right now. Yes, it does pertain. So um, I was living in uh, New York and I just felt discontent. It was just nothing was quite working for me, even though on paper it looked perfect, right? I had my family close by, I had my friends, and I had this gut feeling that I just needed a big life change. And so I decided to to sell half of my things, put the rest in storage, Mm -hmm. and to move to California by myself. And um, I got there and immediately regretted it, and I felt incredibly alone, but I had that mantra, that trust life. And I knew that there was no way that I could have done such a huge life change without something good coming from it. And I just had to be patient. And so I just waited. And um, then I ended up going on a date. And from that date, I met my husband. And what's incredible is that 
I was born in Argentina and my parents moved to the United States when I was a baby. My husband is from Argentina and moved to the United States about two years before I met him in California. And it's like we both were born in the same city, but we were living on two different sides of the country. And then a gut feeling just led me to move all the way to California and to wait. Um, and I met him. And then since then, we moved back to Connecticut. Um, where I have my family, and I'm now eight months pregnant, and we're happily married. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I love it. So, two last questions. First off, homework assignment. I want you to give people a homework assignment today, so they actually take action. What one homework assignment would you give people? Okay, my homework assignment is to notice the way that you speak to yourself when you make a mistake. So next time you walk into the coffee table or you write an email that you didn't like, no matter what it was, notice the critical voice that comes up and begin to tap while you give that voice a voice, a more conscious voice. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you begin to understand why you might have been scared to take action because you don't give yourself room to make a mistake. And when we can change the way that we speak to ourselves when something doesn't go right, we have the freedom to move forward. Yeah. Any last words of wisdom you want to share with people, Jessica? Um, I'll just bring it up again. It is just to, to trust life and to make that your mantra when things aren't going well. I think it's Steve Jobs that has an amazing quote about how you can't connect the dots moving forward. You can only connect them looking back. So you have to have faith in something greater than yourself. And that faith in something greater than yourself will make your life journey so much easier, this tapping experience so much better, because you know that everything you're going through is leading you to something even better. Amen. Like being in California, having you getting punched in the gut and going, something better is going to come out of this. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Can't thank you enough for being on the show today, Jessica. This was brilliant. And if people take action on this, to me, truly life-changing. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get the tapping solution to create lasting change and begin tapping into your flow and trusting life today and shine bright. Woohoo! Woo Thank you so, so much, Jessica. Thank you so much. That was a ton of fun. You make it so easy. You're a great interviewer. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>